about uh, three-fourths of our work is with the private sector. Uh, a developer buys the family farm to develop and it has a cemetery on it, which must be relocated for development purposes. The bodies normally are buried east and west, the head being at the west, the feet being at the east, which is an English costume that was brought over, goes back biblical, Christ will come in the second coming from the east so everybody can stand up and see it. What we're digging up is what they've heard their ancestors talk about. Uh, back then, they were digging a grave, wrapping them and burying them. And then, as they became more settled, uh, there was usually somebody in the neighborhood that could make a pine box. And there were no sawmills back then, so most of the families kept boards for building purposes and things. And the wider boards, they actually saved to make coffins out of. Once you take the topsoil off, you can very easily see with the naked eye where that the top, once you go through the topsoil, that the soil is mixed and you can see the outline of the grave once you get through the topsoil. <laughs> This box is 24 inches in length, 16 inches in width, and 12 inches in height. The reason this size box is used is the only written guidelines for disinterring bodies in North Carolina is by the North Carolina Department of Transportation, which will hold the normal body. So this is what we use, is also known as the Sutton casket. That's, part of, that's the lug off of the casket. Button. Oh yeah. Wood. Now this is, these are some picture frames here. See right okay. here? Oh yeah. This frame. It's got brass in it. There's your glass. That is wonderful. Uh, we, we make up a board on uh, every grave that we relocate in a cemetery and basically what it says it, it gives the name of the cemetery the county the county we're working in and, and the date we're working This, what we actually get out of the grave, belongs to the grave. So we make the announcement ahead of time. If we we find something like a ring, piece of jewelry, or something, they can look at it and awe at it. But it must go in the box and it must be reburied because it's the property of the grave. 
there's 20 people out there that have equal rights to it. How do you divide it? I think it's legitimate to say the house has served this family from 1764 and that's a long time, I must say. I have been nagged for 15 years. It's a wonder I put up with him, my husband, who says, my dear, I think you should do something about cemetery out in the middle of a field. And then he started telling me war stories such as, um, I tell you what's going to happen, Margaret, that whoever buys that is going to come along and grab up all those little marble stuff, take them over to the woods and throw them away. And then the next th morning, when you get up or somebody else gets up, it's been plowed over and it belongs to the farm, and that's not the way to treat your ancestors. So, finally we moved, and we moved, of course, with Mr. Sutton, Ward Sutton, and it's been easy since then. I never really thought about what happens, the process of decay or whatever, but somehow I thought that the, each casket uh, grave would have, here's the head of the bones, here are the arms, here are the legs. It was amazing that we even saw bones, but we saw hairpins and we saw buttons, and it was very interesting to hear that from the buttons you could tell is this the grave of a female or a male yes. because I think the uh, females uh, were three holes in the button. Yeah, three holes in the three button. Three holes in the button or four for the male. <laughs> If you play 12 of those flat pieces, yeah. are you good? Yeah. Alright. You good? Yep. The truck's in. The truck, okay. you're sitting right there. You're sitting right on. Okay. You don't want to get them. We're going to paint it more. They can paint it more than one piece. Where are you going to put it at, Warren? Set it right out down in the edge, wherever you're comfortable. My father's favorite dog. What was that dog's name? Oh, I was counting on you, Margaret. Tuffy is the one that, uh, it was a companion, as she said, and went out to the cemetery, and he buried the remains of Tuffy. Mm -hmm. uh, as it turned out, we, we, as we were searching outside of the fence, there were some bones that didn't look right, and come to find out one of the family members had buried two dogs out there. We moved the dog bones with the rest of them. They were part of the family. The remains are in, um, in the cemetery plot in a little town called Walstenburg, uh, where we all grew up and uh, went to high school. And, uh, and they have a cemetery there that's well kept and it's called Perpetual Care. So we bought, uh, purchased four plots, and this is where we relocated, is a better word, uh, all of the uh, new were over in this cemetery, as well as the, the couple that uh, we found. So everybody is there, and it's quite, uh, it's quite beautiful because those tombstones just stand up like, I mean, they're really tall and not and narrow. And I think we did uh, future people like Evelyn, who's done uh, with all of this research about a family, because we've said who is there and why, uh, where they're registered in Snow Hill. 
and you cared for the people who came before you because certainly, and we're still doing that. When I was five, I witnessed an airline crash. It was a, a fairly large plane colliding with a small one right near the Asheville Hendersonville Airport, and that's where we lived. And so it, it fell all around where we were. And I saw a lot of human remains in that situation. Um, my dad was with me and, and answered my questions. You know, instead of being a horrific event for me, it was an intellectually stimulating event. I hate to say it that way, but. Um, it got me really curious and so I pursued that all through my career. One thing about being a forensic anthropologist, almost everything you encounter is not the expected. It, almost everything you encounter is something new and interesting and when I was in graduate school I really had a rich training in forensic anthropology so I was able to follow my advisor Paul Shuley uh, on his cases while I was a graduate student, a master's student. Every one of them's different, every one of them's interesting. Uh, it's usually the medical examiner or a coroner or somebody in law enforcement that calls me into it. And they do that because they have some remains, either they don't know if they're human or not, or they know they're human and they need uh, some kind of interpretation in terms of how the person died, what happened to them, who they were, some of the biological parameters that speak to that. I don't determine cause of death. That's the medical examiner or the coroner's job. But I can advise the coroner or the medical examiner on my findings for him or her to incorporate into the findings that come from the rest of the case. Forensic anthropology got its start in the United States back in the 19th century. Later on in the 20th century, the wars played a big role because there you had numerous sets of human remains from war dead and it was known who they were and it was known how tall they were. They're all measured when they go into the military and so some of their biological pr parameters were already known. So some methods could be worked out on those skeletons. Later on in the 70s the discipline really kind of took on a name and took on an academic status and uh, we became American Academy of Forensic Sciences they started a section for anthropologists. There has been a, an increase, at least in the profile of forensic anthropology in the public, you know, because shows like Bones and CSI and, uh, you know, mainly mainstream TV, a lot of our students come here because they saw Bones and they want to do that kind of work and be that kind of sort of, you know, um, I, don't, I don't know what the word is, but sort of popular anthropologist, sort of a hot shot. Um, they get in here though and we expose them to the tedium <laughs> that our field is rife with because people don't realize there's a lot that goes on in the lab that takes time. And sometimes, you know, you're in one position with a trowel all day just scraping off little layers of dirt and, you know, it's not what they expect. It's a field that combines hard science, um, biological science and chemistry, and sometimes physics with social science. And I think, it, at least for me, it satisfied um, the wanting to apply what I was learning to something that would help society in some way. So it's taking a hard science and it's applying it to people and it's helping people. And so I think I, I suspect that that's why other women want to get into it. It's also something it, that seems accessible, I think, to women because there's been this demographic shift. Well, when I came here, it was 2005. Um, um, the chancellor at that time was John Bardo, and he wanted a forensic anthropology program, and he wanted a human decomposition facility. And 
you have to have someone at the top wanting these things in order to make it happen. And he did make it happen. And once I got here, when I came, we had about 20 or 30 students. And soon thereafter, we, it really started to grow exponentially. Um, in a very short time, we had over 100 students. And so my contribution has been, I, I teach classes in, mainly upper level classes in various topics within forensic anthropology, um, such as we do a skeletal analysis course where the students, they're senior students, and they um, have a skeleton that they follow all the way through all the lab work, and they interpret, they estimate age and sex and stature and ancestry and look for trauma pathology and all these things. My students who take dental anthropology learn how to identify individual loose teeth because you do come across those and you need to be well familiar with teeth in this field. There's also a summer field school that I teach and it's called Field Recovery of Human Remains. They locate and process a scene on the, on the surface, bone scattered on the surface, and a buried scene as well. And they get a little bit of an opportunity to learn how to recognize the different signs of decomp in the decomp facility. Um, so my contribution has been to bring some of the, the um, applied hands-on, here's what you're going to do when you become a forensic anthropologist training to our student. The human decomposition facility, we call it the Forensic Osteology Research Station, or FOREST for short, and it is in the forest. Um, it's a, an enclosed space with double fencing. There's a privacy fence and a chain link, and the fences are buried so that animals can't dig in. It's a place where we put donated human remains, human bodies, out to decompose, and we study the decomposition process. And it's been, um, it, we were able to get this in 2007, and we put our first person in in 2008, and since then, we've had um, a steady stream of donations. And the, it's been my project since I've been here. It was kind of handed to me, um, which is really cool from my perspective because there's only six of these in the country. We were the second. The famous body farm at UT Knoxville was the first, and we were the second. And um, right now, these facilities are becoming a little bit more common. There's six right now. There's a seventh one that may come up online soon, and rumors of eighth and ninth ones. And so I've started a group of directors of the facilities. There are four of us right now of the six that meet, and we're kind of trying to set the standards for how you manage, maintain, facilitate research, and uh, take care of a human decomposition facility. And. Um, the biggest contribution I think our facility has had, though, to date is education and training. We run a cadaver dog training course twice a year. When I came here, I, I came from Ohio in the flat part of Ohio. It's easy, well, I won't say easy, but it's easy -er to traipse through a cornfield looking for human remains than it is a, a sloped forest. And it just so happened that not long after that, a student came to me and wanted into the program who had been a cadaver dog trainer, it was an older student, and wanted to refine the training using the decomp facility to expose these dogs to the real, the real thing. And so I'm, I was on board pretty much from the beginning. You know, the dogs can do that. And so that's been one major contribution, I think, to education in general. Our students have a wonderful opportunity with the human decomp facility. There are no other undergraduate students who have the access that our students do to decomposing human remains. One of the um, strengths of our field, I think, is, and where a lot of, I, I guess I'd venture to say most forensic anthropologists are now employed, um, is with the federal government and other entities that um, look for remains that are the result of wars where they want to repatriate remains to families, or mass fatality incidents, um, or things like um, the dirty civil wars that went on in South America in the past half decade. Um, and so 
People may not realize that one of our big contributions <laughs> to society is to hold people accountable for um, mistreatment of other humans on a large scale. And so we can collect the evidence that is needed for war tribunals, for example, so that people can be brought to justice. Well, my students, many of them want to go that route. And so I'm trying to prepare them um, in not just the lab part of forensic anthropology, but the field part, because they'll certainly be doing that.